The title of the sermon tonight is Age. It's just a number. It's just a number, right? So uh, I know some of us feel like the number is bigger than others, but we'll, we'll get into that here in a minute. Let, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I do love you and thank you. And Lord, you're such a gracious God, and you take so good care of us. And Lord, uh, no matter what age we are, you can use us. And that's what we want to look at tonight. Lord, I just praise you and honor you for who you are. Uh, again, I thank you for the blessings. I thank you for the many things that you've uh, bestowed upon us. But Lord, I most importantly thank you for your son who died on the cross for me. That's personal. And you cared so much for me. And I can't even imagine where I would be without you. But Lord, you've, you've guided me and you've, you've helped me. And Lord, I just want to bring glory and honor to you. So Lord, with the reading of your word tonight, allow somebody to understand more about what you want them to do and how you want them to go into this uh, next season of their life or, or this next day or week. Lord, we, we need so many people to stand up for you today in our nation. But Lord, that's what we need to be doing is standing up for you and giving you glory and not for ourselves. Lord, I do uh, ask that you be again with this reading of this word. And uh, in your precious holy name we pray. Amen. So, how many know that Miriam was about six or seven years old when she watched Moses go down the river? Six or seven, but that was her job to make sure her little baby brother was taken care of. And she did a good job, did she not? David was about 15 when he anointed king. Now, granted, he, did, he didn't become king at 15, but he was anointed king at the age of 15. Mary, they estimate about... 12 to 14, when she was told she was going to have Jesus. Joseph was about 17 when he had dreams from God about what was going to happen in the future. What about the little boy who had the lunch that fed 5,000? God can use you even at an early age. What about Abraham and Sarah? Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90, and they had Isaac. So don't tell me age matters because it doesn't. Moses was 80 when he left the, led the children out of Israel. Caleb was 85 when he took uh, the mountain of Hebron. And what did he say? I'm as strong as I was when I went into the promised land the first time. That's 45. He was 40. And he said, at 85, I'm as strong as I was then. Let me take him on. Simeon saw the salvation of God at an old age. So no matter what age we are, God can use us. And I understand the passage I'm going to have you turn to, 1 Timothy 4. We'll talk a little bit about Timothy's youth. But I'm here to tell you tonight, it does not matter what your age is. It does not matter what your health is. It does not matter anything. As long as you are available and willing to be used by God, He will use you. Speaking of age, I may or may not just had a birthday, and I'm the big double nickel now, so I, I can get it. I get the senior citizen discount and all that. I already got the military discount, so you know it's it's not that big a deal. But I, I can get it now, and so I started thinking about this. And this was one of the first scriptures that I ever read after I was saved when I felt called to be able to teach and preach. So turn with me, and we're going to get a little bit into this, but turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And this is going to set the stage of why I picked this passage. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies of hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to, to marry, and commending to abstain from foods which God created to receive thank, with thanks by those who believe and the, those who know the truth. For every creature, is God, every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it was received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. That first part, in latter times, people will be departing faith, giving this deceiving spirit. Is that happening today? Do we see that? Were we not at one time considered a Christian nation? 
I'm sorry, but I'm not sure that we're in the majority anymore. So are people leaving the faith? I think so. I think some are getting tired. I know I'm tired of the opposite end, right? What's going on with the politics? But I'm telling you, politics has nothing to do with what we need. We don't need a new politician. We don't need some great leader. We need a revival. That's exactly what we need. We get people saved, that's going to change the world. Not electing a new leader. We need to get people saved. And I'll challenge you that here in a little bit. So Paul, who happens to be one of my heroes, he had been through a lot. I can only imagine some of the stuff that he went through. My life is not even close to that. And But look what he did. And why was he so successful? Why do you think Paul was so successful? I think it was because he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And that he stayed in tune with him. I'll be honest, there's been times that I've been on fire for God, and then I get cold, and then I get on fire for God, and then I get cold. I think Paul was on fire most of the time. Now, he even actually told us that, you know, sometimes he doesn't do the things he wants to do, but other times he does what he doesn't want to do. I think we're all in that boat. I think we all get to that point. But we have to, every single day, seek what God has for you for that day. Yes, we need to plan for the future. I'm not saying we don't plan. But what does God have for you that day? I'm telling you, if you're looking and seeking and asking God, He will make a divine appointment for you. For what? For to make you better? To make something for you? For you to get something? No. He will put somebody in your path that needs to know Him. And that's our job, folks. Why doesn't God just go ahead and take us home when He saves us? He leaves us here to do His work. And unfortunately, I think that's one of the reasons our country's in the shape that it's in is because we haven't been doing our part. We have to be about getting people saved. We get their hearts right with God and everything else will fall into place. I've so many people, especially in the military, they're like, yeah, we're, I'm praying for peace in the Middle East. Folks, there will never be peace in the Middle East until they have peace with God. We can't have peace with one another until we have peace with God. We've got to be about getting folks saved. And that's what Paul is trying to get Timothy to understand. How many know that Paul sent Timothy all over the place? He sent him to other churches. And they estimate Timothy may have been about 21 when he went with Paul the first time. And then Paul started, hey, there's something about this kid. I'm going to use him. And he sent him all over the place. But now he's in Ephesus and he's telling him, hey, I'm about done. And we'll get into that here in a minute. But I'm about done. But you need to carry on. Folks. You may think you're almost done, but God's got something for you. But you need to get the younger ones to help carry on. That's my job at the military right now. I'm the command chief. I'm the highest enlisted person there. But it's not about me anymore. It's about me getting the folks under me ready to do the mission that we have to do. We are here to protect this country. That is our job. I don't care what political party you belong to. I don't care all of that other baloney. I have a task to do, and I need you to understand what it is. We as Christians have a task to do, and that task is to get the younger folks ready for to do the work, because we're not going to always be here. We're not always going to be here. The remnant, the few that we have here sitting here tonight, you may not be here tomorrow, you may not be here next year, you may not be here in five years. Who's going to be sitting in your place? The number one thing that I've found in my military career, every time I've went from one position to the other, my job, other than making sure the mission happens, is who's going to replace me. That's my job. Because I saw it way too often. One individual that knew everything, when he retired, that shop fell apart. 
And it's because they didn't get the person behind them ready. What are you doing to get people ready? It's a hard conversation sometimes. Sometimes it's hard. But you know what? That's our job. That's what we're getting, being called to do. In verse 12, Paul tells Timothy, it says, let no one despise your youth. That's the thing that got me where I was okay with being able to get up in front of somebody. Trust me, I was terrified. I've told you guys many times, I, I would take zero on an oral book report. I would not get up in front of people. And when I felt God telling me, hey, you need to go, I actually wrote a paper, and he said, you need to go read this to the church. And I'm like, uh-uh, that ain't happening. I'm like, who, who am I? I I'm, I'm 23 years old. How, how can I have anything that these older, not you, older people need? How can I have that? And I read this. It says, do not let them spies your use, but be an example to believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. And that was my message, is because when I got saved, I started looking around the church, and I'm like, that's not what the Bible says. But that's not what the Bible says. And how that person's acting is not like I'm like, how, how can we be like that to each other? And how can, I, how, can, how can I, as 23, be able to say, well, this isn't right? Well, it's easy because it's what this says. So when we're out and we're doing things, are we in the Word and are we following the Word? Before I was saved, I read the Bible. There were some really cool stories in there. I mean, David with a slingshot and some other cool stuff. I really liked them. They were good to read. Didn't mean anything to me, though. Once I got saved, it was incredible. Because I knew what a miracle was. I knew that God actually loved me and that He actually cared. And that's where Paul's at. He needs, you need to be an example to others. Yeah, Timothy was young. But it's no different for you guys tonight. You need to be that example for those under you, below you, behind you, that will take your place. Because I'm telling you right now, our nation do not have good role models. Our military doesn't have good role models. They are very few and far between. We have to be the role models if we want this country to change. And we can't be timid about it. But Paul in verse 13 says, Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. What is he talking about here? Is that your private Bible time? No, he said, read it. That's what we're doing tonight. We're reading it out loud. Exhortation. Talk about it. Preach it. Tell others. We actually had a Bible study today at work. And I had a guy who was talking about different things, and we actually had a good conversation. There was about six, seven of us there. And we actually got to talk about the Scriptures that he was talking about. It was awesome. But I have probably about 450 people roughly out there at the base. Why was there only six of us? Sad. But it is a start. Because when I started that almost a year ago, I had three. I've had as many as 20. So I understand people are busy and we get have come and go, but we, sh we should have more than that. Verse 14, something I want you guys to listen to. Do not neglect the gift that is in you. God gives every one of us a gift, 
some more than one. But you have a gift. What is it? Find out. Use it. Ask God to give you opportunities to use it. One of my gifts is leading. And God has given me multiple opportunities. Did I make it all the way to the command uh, chief position on my own? No. God put things in my place and gave me people and gave me opportunities to get to where I'm at. And it wasn't for me. I'm the command chief. If I say we want a Bible study, we can have a Bible study. So God's allowed me to be in position so I can further his word. I, can, I have people coming to me because they know, oh, he goes to church, so I can ask him. Awesome, come and ask me. He's put me in positions so I can use my gift. And the number one thing that your gift should do is bring glory to God. Isaiah 43, 7. We are created for His glory, not ours. Not about us. I just got to promote two people to chief a couple weeks ago. And I charged them both. But the fact remains, it's not about you anymore. Folks, it's not about us in this church anymore. It's about the lost people outside these doors. That's why we're here. We don't come to church just to have a fellowship. Although, as Brother Mike and I say, I, I really like the food. But it, that's not what it's all about. We are about taking care of people outside these churches that don't know Jesus Christ. Start with your own family. That's the hardest one. Actually, probably the hardest ones to get saved are the people who think they're saved and who are not. But the next one's probably your family. They know you the best. But there are so many people that God will put in your path that we need to be making sure we're using our gift. So, Paul was talking about making sure Timothy was ready for his departure. And in uh, 2 Timothy 4, he talks about it in verse 6. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only, to, and not only me, and not to me only, but also to those who lo have loved his appearing. Paul was telling him, hey, I'm, I'm about done. I'm about done. Some of you guys may think you're about done. You're not. Paul did a few other things before he was crucified. I'm willing to bet most likely none of us here will probably be crucified. We'll probably be persecuted. I'm with Brother Mike on that. I think it's coming. Are we ready for that? I have found more times than not that if you tell me I can't do something, I will do everything in my power to make it happen. I'm telling you, you can't win anybody tonight. I'm telling you, you shouldn't go out and witness. Kind of reverse psychology there. I need you to go out and do what God has called you to do. God called me to the military. I thought it was for education. That's not why he called me to the military either. I've deployed. I've, I've been shot at. Nothing like people in World War I, World War II. But I, I, I've, I've paid my dues. For why? Because God called me to do that so I can save some in the military. That's my field. Where's your field? Where's your work? Who are you with? If you're not working, if you're retired, who are you around? Where's your family? I'm telling you folks, we have 
a field that is white, ripe unto harvest. There are so many people, and they're seeking. Believe it or not, people are seeking God because look at our world right now today. Look at the United States. It is not the same one I grew up in originally. It's not the same. So people are seeking and wanting answers. And guess what? We have the answers. The answers are here. And we have to be about, if we don't know it and are not in it, how can we tell others? So Paul was telling Timothy, make sure you're reading the Word. Make sure you're going along with your doctrine. So I want to challenge you with this. Oh, before I do that, one last thing. I read something from Dr. Charles Stanley, and I laid it back there as one of the handouts. How to stay young and useful all of your life. Now, I realize this sounds like it's a dig on the older folks, but it's actually for all the younger ones, too. It's something that we all need to be working on, and I really like it. We need to keep learning. I will never know everything in this, ever. And I know Brother Mike's preached, what, over 42, 42 years? Have you preached out of every verse in here? Keep learning. I, it, I am amazed, because like I said, I used to read the Bible because they're nice stories. But I have read the Bible through I don't know how many times. And there will be times I'll read a passage and I'm like, wow, never saw that before or never realized that or that really hits what I'm going through now. It's alive, folks. We will never, ever learn everything in there. We can try. And that's what we should do. So never keep learning. Keep loving. Folks, I think mercy is lacking but if we have love, we can extend mercy. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I don't have a lot of mercy. Matter of fact, somebody very close to me said, I don't have the gift of mercy. He's probably right. But I have to extend mercy because of the mercy that was extended to me. That's how I became saved. I realized I was going to hell. And I needed a way out. Yes, the love of God will save some. Mercy of God will save others. We have to be out about loving others. Keep laughing. Okay, I, I have to give you this one. I read it today. I've, I've got a dad joke calendar. What do you call a parrot that can't fly? A walkie-talkie. We got we to gotta laugh, folks. We, we got to have a good time. And I love comedians. I love a lot. I, I love to laugh. But we got to keep laughing. Keep leaving. That one took me by surprise when I was reading it. But then it kind of made sense. We got to... We gotta, don't sit at home. I can tell you a stat that I did for the folks at the base. Most people can retire usually somewhere around 55 to 60 at the base. And I found people that are closer to the 50 age range when they retire, if they go out and do stuff, they stay around. But I can tell you out of 22 people that retired within three years, the four that didn't do anything, that said, hey, I got enough money, I don't have to go do anything, I'm just going to go sit at home, four of those people passed away. So keep leaving. Keep longing. What does that mean? Don't ever settle. Well, that's good enough. No, it's not. And that's not my nature. 
my mom was here, she could, could, could attest to it. I threw a fit when I got a B. I couldn't believe I got a B. As a matter of fact, I, my dad had a CB tower by our, by our house. I climbed the tower, got up on the house, and I wouldn't come down. I, I, I wanted the best. I knew I could do better. So keep longing. Don't, don't ever settle. You can do better. Well, I witnessed that person, and they didn't know nothing happened. Go back. Witness to another one. Do not stop. So keep longing. Keep looking ahead. I told you it's not bad to make plans. I got plans to retire. But I still got things to do. I know where, I, what, I, I've got an idea of what's going to happen after I retire. I kind of know where I'm going. I know what I'm wanting to do. So keep looking ahead. Keep looking your best. I'm sorry, but pajamas at Walmart shouldn't be happening. <laughs> Keep leaning on the Lord. You get nothing else out of this. We got to trust in Him and only. Don't trust in yourself. I fail myself all the time, but He has never, ever failed me. Never. And keep listening. I don't know how many times I've heard it. God gave us one mouth and two ears for a reason. We should listen twice as much as we talk. And I know I like to talk. And I don't need anything from the cheap seats back there. I know I like to talk. But I've got to learn to listen better. Too often, this is confession, too often... I'm farly formulating what I need to say when they're talking so I can have the good answer for them instead of just listening. I've got to be better at listening. So in Ezekiel chapter 13, God said, I searched for a man among them who would build up a wall and stand in the gap before me and for the land, so that I may not destroy it. That was Ezekiel 22, uh, 30. What does standing in the gap mean? Football analogy. You got two linemen. They start to block, and they go this way. What's there? All the gaps. Normally, you will have a running back come in and fill that gap so the li other lineman doesn't come through the gap and get to your quarterback. Where's our gaps today as from a Christian standpoint? I don't think we're out in the field. I think we stay in the house. I think we need to be out there. But it could mean, hey, I, I can't go do the mission trip, but I can pray. Well, all I can do is pray. Really? That's all you can do? That's more than some, but that's probably the best thing you can do. Bakari's in Africa right now. I know he can sense our prayer. Are we praying for him? Are you? So all I can do is pray. He would love for you to do that. I can't imagine seven services in one day. Seven services. Over 50 came to Christ. And you can't tell me you can't pray for an hour, for 30 minutes. 20 minutes, 2 minutes, give me something. Stand in the gap for those. What about those that can't talk for themselves? Can you stand in the gap? Can you stand in their behalf?
One of the things I think the gap here stands for in this verse is error that had crept in, falsehood that had crept in. Not seeing that in some churches today? Homosexual priests, is that okay? If it's against what this says, then it's not okay. And we need to stand up for what is right, not what is politically correct, not what we think everybody wants, not what the majority wants, but for what God says. We have to be about this book. And if we're not, I think we're missing the mark. Moses stood in the gap for the children of Israel. God was ready to destroy them. I mean, he gave them manna, took care of them, split the Red Sea. What more do you want? Well, they wanted a lot more, didn't they? And God was like, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. And Moses said, hey, 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 you know, let's think about this. You know, this is for your namesake. I was like, nah, you know, you're right. You're, they're lucky you just said that. How do you know if the next person you see doesn't know Christ and you don't say something and they get hit by some car or have an accident of some sort? How do you know that you weren't supposed to stand in the gap and witness? How about we play it safe? Witness to everyone that we can. I have to say that I absolutely love reading God's Word. And if you don't have a love for it, just start reading it. You will. It is what we, when we're thirsty, we go to this. This is how we get. But guess what? It never quenches my thirst. It makes me want more. And that's a good thing. Go out this week. Find somebody. Ask God to show you who it is. And just say, hey, if you were to die tonight, do you know where you're going? Because if the answer is, I think so, you got a long conversation ahead. Because I know for a fact where I'm going. That's what we need everyone to understand and know. Let us pray. Dear and Father, Lord, I do thank you again for your word. Lord, you're just so gracious to us. And Lord, you take care of me. And with all my faults, you still say you love me. Lord, I uh, just ask that you would be with us this week. Lord, there's so many that we're going to run into contact with this week that probably don't know you. Lord, I ask for a divine appointment for each and every one of us this week. I'd ask that you would guide and direct us to those people, allow things to happen to where we can open up a conversation. And Lord, I just pray that your words come out of us. Not something that we said or something that we, we know of or whatever, but we... We know it's your words that are to them. Lord, it's your word, your Bible that is going to save others. It's not us, but it's us pointing them to you and allowing the Holy Spirit to work in them through us. Lord, I just, again, you're so gracious to us. I ask that you be with us. Keep us safe, Lord, and we do love you and thank you. We want to bring glory, honor, and praise to your holy name. In your precious name we pray. We thank you for joining us this evening at Rahill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.